In 1955, a message crackled across the radio waves that would change naval warfare forever. Underway on nuclear power. Those four words announced that the impossible had become reality. A submarine powered by the atom itself, capable of staying submerged for weeks without surfacing. But behind that historic moment was a man the Navy called notoriously difficult. An engine they said would never work, and a vision that transformed the balance of global power. Hyman George Rickover was not the kind of officer the Navy typically promoted. Short, abrasive, and utterly obsessed with technical perfection, he had little patience for naval tradition and even less for incompetence. Born in Poland in 1900 and raised in Chicago, Rickover graduated from the Naval Academy in 1922 ranking 107th in a class of 540. His classmates dismissed him as a grind who cared more about engineering textbooks than naval customs. Rickover spent the next two decades watching diesel-electric submarines struggle with fundamental limitations that everyone else seemed to accept as unchangeable facts. Every submarine in the world operated on the same basic principle, diesel engines for surface propulsion and electric motors powered by massive lead-acid batteries for underwater operations. The problem was simple physics. Batteries stored pathetically little energy relative to their weight. A typical World War II fleet submarine carried 252 lead-acid cells, weighing over 150 tons, yet this massive battery bank could power the submarine at maximum underwater speed of 8.75 knots for exactly 55 minutes before voltage dropped to unusable levels. This meant submarines weren't really submarines at all. They were surface ships that could temporarily hide underwater. German U-boats during World War II spent 90% of their operational time on the surface, vulnerable to radar detection and air attack. The Type 7C could manage only two knots submerged for 80 hours at silent speed, or 7.6 knots for just 80 minutes at full power. Even with the snorkel, a breathing tube that allowed diesel engines to run while barely submerged, submarines remained fundamentally compromised. The snorkel itself could be detected by radar systems, and running diesels at periscope depth created distinctive noise signatures that sonar operators could track for miles. Worse, snorkeling required precise depth control in rough seas, with waves occasionally flooding the air intake and causing diesel engines to suck air from inside the submarine, creating debilitating pressure drops that caused severe barotrauma. Rickover understood what others missed. Nuclear fission could change everything. While most naval officers saw atomic energy as suitable only for massive power plants on land, Rickover recognized that a nuclear reactor could provide virtually unlimited underwater endurance without the need to surface or snorkel. In 1946, Rickover was assigned to the Manhattan Project's Oak Ridge facility, where he studied nuclear reactor technology with characteristic intensity. He spent months crawling through reactor facilities, questioning engineers about heat transfer coefficients, neutron flux patterns, and radiation shielding requirements. While other naval officers focused on nuclear weapons, Rickover saw propulsion potential in controlled atomic energy. The resistance was immediate and fierce. Admiral Chester Nimitz himself questioned whether nuclear propulsion was worth the enormous development costs. Senior naval officers argued that nuclear reactors were too large, too heavy, and too dangerous for shipboard use. The only reactors in existence were massive installations like the X-10 graphite reactor at Oak Ridge, which occupied an entire building and required hundreds of tons of graphite moderator. Captain Armand Morgan calculated that a submarine reactor would need to weigh at least 1,000 tons and require a pressure hull 50 feet longer than conventional submarines. Even worse was the radiation risk. A reactor accident on a surface ship was bad enough, but on a submarine hundreds of feet underwater, any failure would be catastrophic. Rickover ignored the skeptics and focused on engineering challenges with single-minded intensity. In 1947, he established the Naval Reactors Branch within the Bureau of Ships, creating a unique organization that reported simultaneously to the Navy and the Atomic Energy Commission. This dual reporting structure gave Rickover unprecedented authority to override both military bureaucracy and civilian contractors when technical requirements demanded it. 
The first problem was size. The Oak Ridge reactor occupied 1,500 square feet and stood 24 feet high, far too large for any submarine hull. Rickover's team needed to reduce reactor volume by at least 90% while maintaining sufficient power output to drive a submarine weighing about 3,500 tons submerged at high speed underwater. Working with Westinghouse Electric Corporation, Rickover's engineers developed a pressurized water reactor design that used ordinary water as both coolant and neutron moderator. This eliminated the need for massive graphite blocks while providing superior heat transfer characteristics. The reactor core itself was surprisingly compact, a cylinder approximately 8 feet tall and 4 feet in diameter, containing fuel assemblies arranged in a precise grid pattern. While still classified, we estimate that each fuel assembly contained uranium-zirconium alloy metal fuel enriched to approximately 93% uranium-235, arranged in a plate-type configuration that maximized surface area for heat transfer. The fuel plates were composite structures clad in advanced zirconium alloys manufactured to precise tolerances that could withstand extreme temperatures and pressures. This sandwich design provided the rapid heat transfer essential for high-performance submarine operations. The engineering tolerances were brutal. Reactor pressure vessels were forged from solid steel billets weighing over 100 tons, then machined to exacting specifications with mirror-smooth internal surfaces. The vessel heads were secured with dozens of massive bolts torqued to precise specifications using hydraulic tensioning equipment. Welds were x-rayed, ultrasonic tested, and pressure tested well above operating pressure. Rickover established inspection teams that reported directly to him, bypassing normal Navy procurement procedures. Contractors learned to fear his inspections, where he would crawl through reactor compartments with a flashlight, examining welds and checking clearances with the intensity of a man who knew that lives depended on every detail. The primary cooling system operated as a closed loop circulating water through the reactor core at high pressure and temperature. Multiple primary coolant pumps moved thousands of gallons per minute through the reactor core and into steam generators. The steam generators contained thousands of tubes arranged in configurations that transferred heat from the radioactive primary loop to a clean secondary steam system. The prototype reactor, designated S1W, was built at the National Reactor Testing Station in Arco, Idaho. The S stood for submarine, one indicated it was the first generation from its contractor, and W designated Westinghouse as the manufacturer. The entire reactor plant was installed inside a full-scale submarine hull mock-up, allowing engineers to test not just nuclear components, but the integration of reactor, steam generators, turbines, and propulsion systems. Testing began in March 1953 with initial criticality achieved using control rods made of boron steel and silver indium cadmium alloy, though Rickover's program would later standardize on hafnium as the primary neutron absorbing material. The control rod drive mechanisms used magnetic clutches that could insert rods into the core in less than two seconds, providing emergency shutdown capability even if all electrical power was lost. The S1W generated substantial thermal energy, driving steam turbines that produced enough horsepower to push a submarine through the water at speeds exceeding 20 knots submerged. But power was only part of the equation. The reactor had to operate reliably in conditions no land-based plant would ever face. Rolling seas, depth charges, emergency maneuvers, and constant vibration. Redundancy was built into every system. Multiple primary coolant pumps provided cooling even if some failed. Emergency cooling systems could remove decay heat using natural circulation if all pumps stopped working. The reactor core was designed with negative temperature coefficients, meaning that as temperatures rose, the nuclear reaction naturally slowed down, a built-in safety feature that made runaway reactions virtually impossible. By 1955, the prototype had logged thousands of hours of operation demonstrating that nuclear propulsion was not only possible but reliable enough for submarine operations. The reactor had been tested through simulated emergency conditions, including loss of coolant accidents, electrical failures, and rapid power changes that duplicated combat maneuvering requirements. 
the ultimate test came with integration into an actual submarine hull. The USS Nautilus, designated SSN-571, was laid down at Electric Boat in Groton, Connecticut, on June 14, 1952, with a reactor compartment specifically designed around the S-2W plant, an improved version of the Idaho prototype. The S-2W reactor incorporated lessons learned from prototype testing, including improved steam generators with advanced tubing that resisted corrosion and stress cracking. Installation required precision that exceeded anything previously attempted in submarine construction. The reactor vessel had to be lowered into the hull through a temporary opening, then welded into place with tolerances measured in fractions of an inch. On January 17, 1955, Commander Eugene Wilkinson gave the order that changed naval history, underway on nuclear power. The Nautilus slipped beneath the surface of Long Island Sound and began a submerged run that would have been impossible for any previous submarine. Just the steady hum of steam turbines powered by controlled nuclear fission. The performance numbers were staggering. Where diesel electric submarines could manage perhaps eight knots submerged for a few hours before battery depletion forced them to surface, Nautilus could sustain over 15 knots underwater for days at a time averaging speeds that would have drained a diesel-electric battery in minutes. Her theoretical range was essentially unlimited, constrained only by food supplies and crew endurance rather than fuel capacity. During her first two years of operation, Nautilus logged over 60,000 miles, more than any single submarine had ever traveled in such a short window of time. Speed trials demonstrated capabilities that seemed impossible to officers trained on conventional submarines. More importantly, she could maintain maximum speed for hours without any degradation in performance, while conventional submarines experienced rapid battery depletion that reduced speed to barely three knots within two hours. The real test came in 1958 with Operation Sunshine, a top-secret mission that would demonstrate the strategic implications of nuclear propulsion. Nautilus was ordered to transit under the Arctic ice cap, a journey impossible for diesel-electric submarines, which would have no way to surface and recharge their batteries in the ice-locked polar sea. Planning for the Arctic transit required solving navigation problems that had never been encountered in submarine operations. Magnetic compasses were useless near the magnetic North Pole, and celestial navigation was impossible while submerged under solid ice. The solution was the N6A1 ship's inertial navigation system, a gyroscopic platform that could maintain accurate position information without external references. The system weighed 2,500 pounds and required constant temperature control, but it could determine the submarine's position within 1,000 yards after days of submerged operation. Sonar systems were modified to detect ice formations above the submarine using upward-looking experimental sonar that could map ice thickness and identify potential surfacing areas. The experimental sonar could detect ice keels extending 60 feet below the surface, providing advance warning of obstacles that could damage the submarine's sail or periscopes. Departing Pearl Harbor on July 23, 1958, Nautilus headed north through the Bering Strait, where pack ice extended up to 60 feet below the surface, leaving minimal clearance between ice keels and the 180-foot seafloor. The submarine operated at depths between 200 and 400 feet, using sonar to navigate through a three-dimensional maze of ice formations that would have crushed any surface vessel. The reactor maintained full power while operating in water temperatures near 29 degrees Fahrenheit. Primary coolant temperatures remained stable, demonstrating that the reactor's thermal performance was unaffected by external conditions. Steam generators continued producing steam throughout the under-ice transit. On August 3, 1958, at 11.15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Nautilus reached the geographic North Pole while running submerged at 400 feet. The submarine had completed 1,830 miles in 96 hours, averaging roughly 19 knots submerged while navigating through ice formations that extended as deep as 125 feet below the surface. The strategic implications were immediate and profound. Nuclear submarines could operate in areas previously inaccessible to naval forces, 
turning the Arctic Ocean from an impassable barrier into a potential highway for submarine operations. The shortest route between the United States and Soviet Union passed directly under the North Pole, and nuclear submarines could now use this route for rapid deployment or strategic deterrent patrols. More importantly, nuclear propulsion created the possibility of a true second strike capability, submarines that could remain hidden underwater for weeks, immune to first strike attacks and capable of delivering devastating retaliation. The Polaris Submarine Launched Ballistic Missile Program, initiated in 1956, depended entirely on nuclear propulsion to provide submarines with the underwater endurance necessary for strategic deterrent patrols. The Soviet Union had already recognized the threat and launched K-3 Leninsky Komsomol in 1957, before Nautilus's Arctic crossing. The Soviet submarine used a pressurized water reactor, the VMA plant, which provided substantial power but suffered from reliability problems that plagued Soviet nuclear submarines for decades. The British followed with HMS Dreadnought in 1963, powered by an American S-5W reactor provided under the 1958 US-UK Mutual Defense Agreement. The technology transfer gave Britain immediate access to proven reactor technology while establishing American reactor designs as the international standard for nuclear submarine propulsion. But it was Rickover's insistence on absolute technical standards that gave the U.S. nuclear submarine force its decisive advantage. While Soviet nuclear submarines suffered from reactor accidents, radiation leaks, and operational failures that killed crew members and contaminated vast areas of ocean, the U.S. nuclear navy compiled an unmatched safety record. Rickover's training programs produced nuclear-qualified officers and enlisted personnel who understood their systems with extraordinary depth. Nuclear training schools provided intensive education in reactor physics, thermodynamics, and nuclear engineering. Students who couldn't maintain high academic standards were immediately disqualified from nuclear programs. Every nuclear submarine officer had to pass Rickover's personal interview a grueling interrogation that tested not just technical knowledge, but character, judgment, and attention to detail. Officers who couldn't explain the function of every valve in the reactor plant were rejected. Those who showed any tendency toward shortcuts or casual attitudes toward safety were eliminated. The reactor technology itself continued to evolve. The S-3W plant in the USS Skate demonstrated that nuclear submarines could surface through Arctic ice, breaking through ice sheets several feet thick. The S-5W reactor in the USS Skipjack introduced the teardrop hull design that maximized underwater speed and maneuverability, achieving submerged speeds exceeding 30 knots. By the 1960s, nuclear submarines were routinely operating at depths and speeds that made them nearly invulnerable to existing anti-submarine warfare techniques. The Thresher, later Permit Class could dive to operational depths around 1,000 feet while maintaining full combat capability. Attack submarines could outrun surface ships and most torpedoes, while ballistic missile submarines could remain submerged for 70-day patrols without any degradation in reactor performance. Rickover's influence extended far beyond submarine design. His engineering standards, comprehensive training, and safety policies became the template for every nuclear navy that followed. The pressurized water reactor design pioneered for Nautilus became the basis for most commercial nuclear power plants, spreading Rickover's engineering philosophy throughout the civilian nuclear industry. But even a legacy as dominant as Rickover's had limits. In 1982, Rickover was finally forced into retirement, not by scandal or incompetence, but by a man he once rejected. Years earlier, he had passed over a young officer for the nuclear program, saying he lacked the right temperament. That officer was James D. Watkins, who rose to become Chief of Naval Operations. And when he did, he made the call that Rickover was out after more than six decades in uniform. His engine, they said would never work, had redefined the strategic balance of the Cold War and established nuclear propulsion as the single greatest leap in the history of submarine warfare.